One of the most important churches in the city of Rome is the Church of St. Mary Major, in Italian La Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore. It is located on one of the famed seven hills of Rome, the Esquiline Hill, which is just next to the Roman Forum, where the center of ancient Roman city life took place. The Forum is in a valley between the Esquiline Hill on the one hand and the Palatine Hill, where Rome actually began on the other. And so one of the earliest settlements in the city of Rome outside of the old parts was on the foothills of the Esquiline Hill. This was indeed called in ancient Rome the Subura, where we get the word suburb from. So the Esquiline, you can say, was the first suburb in world history. At the top of the Esquiline Hill, we find this majestic basilica. It is one of the four papal basilicas, which are designated as such because they stand for and represent the heart of the Church of Rome. Those four are, as you might expect, the Basilica of St. Peter and the Basilica of St. Paul, the two apostles of the city of Rome, as well as the Cathedral of Rome, St. John Lateran, and this one, St. Mary Major. The church itself was built in the early 5th century. The church itself was built in the early 5th century. Yet its founding goes back before that. It has, like many places in Rome, a legendary founding that is based this time surely in history. But the legend kind of covers over what we know of the hardcore history facts. So let me just tell you the legend. The legend has it that in the year 358, a young man named John had a vision of Mary who asked him to build a church on the spot where the snow would fall. Now this was on August the 5th, the heart of the heat of Roman summer. He went to the Bishop of Rome, Liberius, and Liberius confirmed that he too had had a vision of Mary, and so they heard commotion on the Esquiline Hill. And so the story goes, they went up to the top of the Esquiline Hill and found it covered in snow in the heat of the Roman August. Liberius then traced the outline of the church in the snow, as this painting depicts, and a church was built on that site. We know this church was indeed built in the late, well, the second half of the, of the, third, of the fourth century, because the Liberian Basilica, called such because Pope Liberius built the basilica, was a place where different meetings happened during those early years of legalized Christianity. Some 80 years later, the Liberian Basilica was completely replaced with the one we have today. This was what we call the Sistine Basilica, because it was built by Pope Sixtus III. Now, why would he take a perfectly good Liberian Basilica dedicated to Mary and redo it on indeed a larger scale, in this majestic form we have. Well, this was an occasion of a particularly important event in Christian history. This was a, a council, what we call an ecumenical council, in other words, a gathering of bishops from throughout the Christian world in the town of Ephesus in Asia Minor. And this council met to work out what we mean as Christians and what the Bible indeed means when it says that Jesus is God and is human. And the Council of Ephesus in 432 declare that at every moment the human life of Jesus was also the divine life of Jesus. That from the moment of his conception, if this was the conception not of a, of a mere man, but the conception of the Son of the Father, that he was fully God and fully human. And therefore, the Council of Ephesus said, it is perfectly proper to call Mary the mother of God, because the one whom she bore in her womb was indeed God himself. Now, this declaration was celebrated, and in, particularly in Rome, because Pope Sixtus saw, saw this as doing due honor to Mary, the mother of God, and so decided to rebuild the um, Esquiline Basilica, into the dimensions we see before us today. As I, as I said, this is called the, the Sistine Basilica, 
as in distinction from the Liberian Basilica because Sixtus III built it. It keeps the name of the dedication of the Liberian Basilica, however, because not only is it dedicated to Mary, the Mother of God, it is also called the Basilica of Our Lady of the Snows. And indeed, on the feast day of this basilica, August 5th, which is celebrated indeed throughout the world in all Catholic churches on, the, on August 5th, in this basilica, at evening prayer or vespers on that day, during the Magnificat, lily petals are dropped down through the ceiling to recall the snowfall. It's quite a nice um, event that you can participate in if you're in Rome on August the 5th. The basilica itself is majestic. It has been added to and developed over the years since it was completed in 435. There's a lot of 435 that you can still see in the basilica, but as you approach, what you see is nothing of the fifth century. What you see are three levels of later additions. You see the development in the early 1300s of the mosaic that was placed on the facade and the bell tower attached to the basilica. And you have the undulating Baroque facade that was added in the mid 1700s. All of this to give greater glory to the basilica. And this Baroque addition we see uh, um, complemented on the back side of the basilica, the only basilica in Rome that has a full de uh, decoration on the back side, with all of the statues going all the way around the basilica. <clears throat> to go in, you have to go up because it's the top of the basilica. So this accentuates the symbolism because all basilicas, all churches work with a basic Christian symbolism of the path pilgrimage to God as you enter into, this, into a basilica. And to go up, as always, in Christian and even Jewish tradition, mean to get closer to God. Not that God is up and we are down, but the upness suggests a, a, an ascent to the presence of God. So as we go up, we go up, as the psalm says, to the altar of God. And as we enter through the portico of the basilica, technically known as the narthex, we see even further the Baroque edition sponsored by the King of Spain, and we see a statue of him over to our right as we enter. And we see the holy door. Each of these four papal basilicas has a door that is only open during Jubilee years. And this door is opened as during these Jubilee years, during these holy years, as a way of dedicating yourself, rededicating yourself to Christ if you come to Rome on pilgrimage during these years. When you enter into the basilica, you step from the Baroque into the earlier ages of the basilica. The first thing perhaps you notice is the medieval cosmetesque floor which is very typical of Roman church floors from the 12th century to the 15th century, where pieces of marble are taken and embedded in the floor in patterns that make the floor come alive with movement. It symbolizes both the grace of God that flows out from the altar to us, welcoming us in, and our movement towards the altar, being drawn by this grace, being motivated by the beauty that the love of God is instilled in, instills in us and being drawn towards the glistening mosaics around the altar. They also set a pattern for the processions during the liturgy. We look up and we see gold, shining gold ceiling, which would accentuate the light that in early Roman basilicas, and indeed in this original 5th century basilica, would have been coming in only from the upper story of the basilica, what we call the clerestory, or the clear story of the basilica, where the windows would have been open for light, and the gold would pick that up and reflect it. <clears throat> this gold is not from the 5th century, it is from the 15th century, put in in 1496 by Pope Alexander VI, and indeed, it is thought to be, probably is, the first gold received in Rome from the New World. 
What you can then see, though, is actually the 5th century decorations. If you notice above the columns, you see a spiraling vine, mosaic vine, and above that vine, you see mosaic images. These are images from the Old Testament, various scenes from the Old Testament. The vine and the scenes are both from 432. 434, 435, when the Basilica was originally built. They are the earliest images of the Old Testament that we have in any, in any completeness. There are only a few scenes prior to that. And so this is the fullest illustration, you might say illustrated book, of the Old Testament in, in existence. These invite you forward. And you move forward down the long nave of the Basilica, following that cosmati pattern until you reach the majestic altar. Now, this altar was also um, modified over time. It was moved forward in the late 13th century, and it was completely decorated in the mid-1700s with that big canopy over the altar, reflecting the spiral of the canopy of St. Peter, and an open space in front of the altar called a con confessio. <clears throat> but the arch decorations go back earlier. In fact, the first arch, what we call the triumphal arch, has the original mosaics from 435. And these are not only inspiring, but also quite interesting, because you can see in the center, there's the lamb on the throne with the seven candlesticks, all of these images from the book of Revelation, very significant um, source of much decorations around altars in sanctuaries. That was what we call the space around the altar, the sanctuary. In sanctuaries, in church decoration throughout the first millennium of Christianity. Beneath the lamb and the throne, there is the inscription that dedicates this church by Sixtus. It says Sixtus III, Bishop of the People of God. And around this are scenes from the early life of Jesus. There is the Annunciation. There is the dream of Joseph. There is a visit of the three wise men and Mary and Joseph fleeing to Egypt and the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem. All of these come together to show you that it is in the womb of Mary that humanity and divinity are joined together, that God is no longer remote, driven away from us by our sin, or rather kept away from us by our sin, but has now penetrated himself into human existence and taken humanity for his own, such that he now dwells with us, continuing in the person of Jesus. And as we look Further, we see the apse, the curved area where the bishop's chair is. And this apse mosaic, which was done in, in um, 1285 by Pope Nicholas IV, of Mary being crowned Queen of Heaven. Now, what can we say about the Basilica as a whole? There are many, many details. Of course, we could go into much, much, more, much, much more detail. But as a whole, why dedicate a church to Mary? And particularly this one, which is Santa Maria Maggiore, the, the biggest or the best or the most important church to Mary. Why is it so significant? Well, in Catholic thought and medieval thought as well, Mary is the not only the, the first disciple, the one who gives herself as the instrument of God, the servant of the Lord, not only the model disciple, the one who dedicates her whole life to serving Jesus, but she is also the image of the church and the mother of the church. Her role, as we Catholics understand it, continues even today because she was taken at the moment of the, her death or at the end of her earthly life. She, she was taken body and soul into heaven, basically resurrected like her son. And she now stands with Christ in heaven, praying with the church and praying for the church. She is not only the mother of Jesus, but the mother of all humanity, because it is through her that our voices are articulated in the presence of the Holy Trinity. 
we unite our prayer to hers as we pray. Not that she is divine in any way, but that she brings together the human longing for God and presents us to Christ. Every prayer that happens, happens, we would say as Catholics, through Mary. So even when we don't call upon her in our prayer explicitly, she still joins with us in prayer, just as all of the saints always join with us in prayer, whether we mention them or not. It is helpful, we would say, to call upon her because it, sh it, it increases the richness of our prayer. We are aware that we're not praying solitarily alone in the dark, but we are praying with those who have gone before us, and particularly with Mary, who has in her care the care of the, of the church. She is an image, a model, whom we all strive to imitate. So every Christian has the aim of becoming Christ, but also becoming Mary. We are meant to be like Christ, and we are meant to join ourselves to Christ so completely as Mary did. So Mary and Christ are both images to which we aspire. And all of this you can find in the church, because the church itself is Every church itself becomes an image of Mary as the womb where the Word takes flesh. So the Word takes flesh in us as we gather to celebrate the Eucharist together in this womb-like space, which is the space where God comes to us. And so every church, we would also say, is an image of the church universal and thus an image of Mary as well. Which is why this church is a, is a favorite of many popes, including the current Pope, Pope Francis, who comes to the church rather frequently to pray, and to pray specifically before the icon of Mary housed here. This icon is a very important medieval icon that was always used as a, um, as, as a, a uh, what we call it, as an orientation to pray for the mercy of Christ during times of trouble. It is called um, the Solus Populus Romanum, the, the salvation or the healing of the people of Rome. And they would always bring out this icon of Mary in procession whenever there was a crisis in Rome. It is today housed in, not above the main altar as it was for most of its uh, time here, but now in a side chapel, uh, built by Pope Paul V of the Borghese family, which is the chapel, the family chapel of the Borghese family today. And you can see it there. That's a brief, brief, brief introduction to Santa Maria Maggiore. There's a lot more we could say. I would encourage you to come to Rome and to see it in person. It is beautiful and it is quite inspiring. Thank you. Thank you.